Happy New Year. Uh, I know you probably heard that a, a million times uh, before coming tonight, but it's the first time I'm seeing all of you, so Happy New Year, and I'm so glad that you guys are in God's house tonight because we really believe, uh, not just as a staff, but really that when you, the way you start something really is a good indication on how that year is going to turn out for you, and so for you being in the house tonight, give yourselves a round of applause because you're really setting the tone for your year to be a really good year, and uh, I know many of us celebrated New Year's um, at different places and done different things. And I saw this meme on Instagram that really, I think, gives us a picture for how many of you acted and were doing New Year's Eve and as the, the clock strikes uh, midnight. This is probably every single one of our facial reactions to how that, that process was. So put that meme up on, on, on screen. 11.59, we, we, we're sad. Clock strikes 12 o'clock, we're all happy. And then 12.01, we're right back to where we were um, not too long ago. How many of you that, that you relate to that? That was kind of like you, that you're experiencing the new year. And I want to encourage you, no matter how that you started this year and maybe what kind of emotions or feelings that you have, that you're here tonight and God's mercies are new every single morning. And that we're going to be going through a series called Essentials. And we're going to look at really the building blocks for our lives this new year. We want to set the, the course of our hearts in the right direction. And we're going to talk about some fundamental things that we need to apply to our lives to really help us to establish a solid foundation. So if you have your Bibles, you can open it up to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to look at this uh, uh, 10 verses in Matthew chapter 7 to set the context of what we're going to be reading and discussing tonight. It's D Jesus basically talking about really what it's like to be a disciple of him. And he's giving us some imagery, some metaphors that really break down and give us a glimpse into what it's practically looked like for us to really follow him with our lives. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 17 to 27, we're going to look at 10 verses here. Uh, so bear with me as we go through this. There's a lot of meat in this entire passage, and we're going to do our best to really apply it to our lives this evening. So verse 17, it says this. Jesus is speaking. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Very scary verse right there. Next verse says this, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and, that, and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the what? On the rock. Had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put, it, put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house at Sandy Beach. You can add that to it. Um, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. And it fell with a great crash. Let's pray tonight. God, we thank you for this word. God, we thank you for every single person here setting their new year right in your house, God. I pray that this will be a good indication to really how this 2016 will be for, for us this year. And God, and no matter what happened last year, Lord, we, we don't want to carry those baggage into this new year. But we thank you that we, you, we have an opportunity to start fresh, God. So even though it's a new year, you're the same God. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as we continue to trust you with our lives, God, we thank you that you are the sure foundation on which we can build our lives, God. Everything else in this world is not a, a solid foundation, but, Lord, you are the solid rock. So, Lord, I pray tonight that you would speak a word that would give us a glimpse into what you want this year to be like for many of us. God, so speak clearly. Our hearts and our souls and our ears are listening to really what you want to reveal to us. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Uh, title of my message tonight is this, The Foundation Block. The Foundation Block. So New Year comes with uh, uh, new resolutions. And uh, I was thinking about some of uh, my resolutions and different things. That How many of us do resolutions? Like that's your thing. Like you set already what you want to do 2016. How many of us? Just be honest. You 
kind of slipped some things. Everyone's kind of shamed tonight. You don't want to say anything? This is church. You can be honest. I saw another picture on Instagram that really give, gives me a picture on to really what my year is going to be like. You can put that, that slide up, Darren. It's my goal for 2016 is to achieve the goals of 2015, which I have done uh, in 2014, as I plan, promised in 2013 and planned in 2012. How many of that's you? Like, you, you set goals and you've had goals, the same goals since 2012. Nothing really amounted much in your life. I remember uh, going into 2015, the goal that I set for myself that year was it's going to be Lean Mean 2015. That was the hashtag that I lived by. That's the model that I wanted to live by. Lean Mean 2015 came to the point, and I actually did pretty good. I got to a point where I was pretty in good shape, and then it, I realized that it just started to take too much of my life. And so I started to, like, you know, ease away from it to the point where I just ended 2015 with just Mean 2015. I dropped the Lean, and it just ended up being Mean, uh, and that's kind of like how my year ended. And I know many of us, we set goals and different things. And what we want to look at in this entire series is really the, the right things that we should be building our lives upon. There's so many things, and we're not knocking goals and aspirations, and, and we're making fun of that. But we really want to set the course of our lives straight this year by building our lives on the right foundation. And throughout this entire series called Essentials, we're going to look at the fundamental building blocks on which that we should really be a living our lives and building our lives upon. And there's so many things that we could strive for in this new year. And I hope that you hit your goals of fitness and whatever it is, getting good grades, getting a good paying job, whatever it is that you set for this new year, I hope that you hit it. But beyond just hitting these goals, I hope that our lives are built on these foundations because it really is going to set the tone for our lives this, this new year. So if we're talking about a simple foundation, tonight we're going to talk about this principle called lordship. And in your notes, it says this, storms reveal what our lives are built on. Storms reveal what our lives are built on. Jesus basically uses this analogy talking about houses. And our lives are like houses. And he gives us two metaphors on which our lives can be built on. It's either being built on sand or on the rock. And two different foundations that produces dramatic outcomes. If we build it on the rock, when the storms come, it basically allows us to stay firm, but if our lives are built on sand or anything else apart from Christ, it basically says that our foundation is weak and it will be revealed in the storms. Storms basically reveal what our lives are built on. And every single one of us in this place tonight have our lives built on something. Maybe it's a principle, a belief, or a mindset that you're building your life upon, and you never really know what your life is built on until you go through some storms. Because I don't know about you, every, every single one of us, we have good intentions with our lives. We have good things that we think we're building our lives upon until we hit a storm. And basically what the storm does, it reveals really what our true foundation is. I have with me right here is, a, what is this? It's bottled water, right? Um, it's not anything like complex. It's just a, a bottle of water. And really what happens in storms it, is storms pretty much shake up our lives, right? And really, when I, when I shake this water, uh, water bottle, what happens here? I'm making it rain on the stage. I better clean this up. Yes, I will. Sorry, worship team. Um, but the shaking basically allowed what was inside to come out. There's nothing wrong with this bottle of water. I can drink it. it tastes great. Very refreshing. But really what happened is through the shaking, what was on the inside of this bottle actually came out. And when our lives go through storms, God allows our lives to be shaken to reveal what's on the inside of our hearts. That's really what shaking does. It basically reveals what's already there. Sometimes we get mad at the shaking instead of dealing with what's actually coming out of our lives. We get mad at God. God, why am I, why am I going through this shaking in my life? Why am I going through this storm and that storm? And God is saying, I'm allowing that to reveal what's on the inside of you. Because you never know what's really there until you actually have your lives shaken up. And all of us here, we think our lives are good. We think we're better than what we are. And then God allows us to go through storms in his love because he wants us to be like him. And he wants us to see really what our lives are built on. And so what he does is he allows storms to reveal, shake up our foundation, to reveal really what we're building our lives upon. Are we building it upon him and his word because he is the sure foundation that we can build our lives upon? Or are we building it upon ourselves, upon getting our, our own needs met upon relationships or finances or all these different things, the storms will reveal 
what's already there. Uh, many of us have been, know that about a week ago, um, the Miss Universe pageant happened, and pretty much um, we all know what exactly happened, right? So Steve Harvey was the announcer, and uh, he basically announced the wrong winner. And this literally, like, broke the internet because everyone jumped on this. And in his mistake, he basically announced that Miss Columbia was supposed to be the winner, but in fact, he read the card wrong, and instead, it was actually supposed to be Miss Philippines. So Miss Columbia is thinking that she won the whole pageant, and then, er, skirt, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, let, uh, she's not the winner. Take the crown off. You know, it was just a really embarrassing moment. How many of you saw that, watched that on, on the internet? The thing about, I, like a, I don't like about the internet is that things go viral instantly, and from this moment, memes was immediately like just filter out through our entire feed and everyone is making fun of it, pretty much jumping on, on Steve Harvey, putting him on blast. And there's a couple memes that I thought were pretty funny. We can put up the first one. Um, that one, <laughs> is it too late now to say sorry? <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny, um, putting his face. And what was the next one? Um, you'll get a Christmas bonus. You'll get a Christmas bonus. Actually, I read that wrong. Everyone's getting fired in this place. Um, well, that was, didn't have enough <laughs> jokes as the first one. And so people were like literally making fun of Steve Harvey in his moment. How many of you know that what Steve, that we can consider that a storm? Like in, on national television, you make a mistake and everyone puts you on blast for that. Not a bright moment for him. But this storm basically revealed what foundation his life was built upon. Because I love the fact that he took ownership of it. He didn't make any mistakes he didn't, uh, he didn't um, make any excuses. He didn't put blame on other different people. People were blaming the, the printout of the car that it should have been a lot clearer. And, and there's could have been blame that went that direction. But you know what he did in that moment of, of honesty? He owned it. And in humility, he apologized to it. And he basically turned a negative situation. But that situation revealed the character that was in his life, the foundation that he was really building his life upon. And he is a believer. And in that moment of a mistake... He didn't point fingers at other people. He manned up. He took ownership of it, and he basically apologized. And there was this tweet that he put that really reveals his heart. He said, I don't want to take anything from this amazing pageant, uh, as well as the wonderful contestants. They were all amazing. Secondly, I'd like to apologize to the viewers at that, um, that I disappointed as well. Again, it was an honest mistake, and the last one was the best. I'd like to apologize whole wholeheartedly to Miss Columbia and Miss Philippines for my huge mistake. I feel terrible owned it, took responsibility, communicated to everyone else that he didn't make an honest mistake and basically owned that situation. You know when you go through storms, do you put blame on other people or do you take ownership of the situation? When we go and make mistakes to life, because you will, are you going to point fingers at other people? It was that person's fault. It was that because of this, this, this. And we're pointing fingers everywhere else and not taking ownership of our part. Humility and character when storms happen, get revealed, and what comes out of us is going to reveal what foundations we build our lives upon. Steve Harvey, what came out of him is really the foundations in which God is trying to get into our lives, that he built his life upon the rock. And I love the fact that a ton of different people came to support him, and even people were saying that uh, Miss Columbia was going to sue him for $5 million, which is actually a lie. Somebody made that up. But even her, in that moment, she took ownership of it too. And she says this, I was able to bring happiness to my country after becoming Miss Universe for only a couple of minutes. Life continues, and in the future, we will find out why things happen the way they happen. Taking ownership of it, saying, I don't understand why that happened. But I'm just going to trust that eventually I'll discover these things. So in our lives, do we have this humble attitude to trust God no matter what happens are we going to just try to put blame on other people? Blame can be going anywhere else, but at the end of the day, God allows different things to happen to reveal what's in our hearts. And what in our hearts reveal what our lives are built upon. Next in your notes, it says this, the fruit of our lives reveal our foundations. You don't have to wait to go, to go through storms to see what your life is built upon. You can actually look at your life and see what kind of fruit it's producing. Matthew 7, 17 says this, uh, every good tree bears what? Good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. So we don't have to wait for a storm to come. We can actually look at what our lives are producing. We call that fruit. 
And any single person knows that you can, you can tell what kind of tree it is by the fruit that it produces. Many times it's hard to actually describe what kind of tree it is by just looking at the bark or even the leaves. But the fruit gives us a true picture of really what kind of tree that is. You see a tree, it's a mango tree. That's a mango tree because you see mangoes on the tree. Get it? You see lychee on the tree. What is that? A lychee tree. This is pretty simple. And so when we look at our lives, we can look at and see what kind of fruit our lives are producing because that will give us an indication on really what our lives are built upon. And so Jesus gives this thing that we can actually fool ourselves to give the wrong impression by, by just saying that because you're doing different things that your life is producing fruit, but the proof is in the fruit. We can fool different people by doing different things, but really what's coming out of our lives, you can't fool anybody about that. And so when we're talking about as believers, our lives should reflect the tree that we're connected to, which is Christ. Our lives should reflect the characteristics of Christ. We can't expect people who are not connected to Christ to produce godly fruit. And sometimes in church, we get frustrated with people because they're not producing the fruit that we think they should produce. But in reality, what is happening is it's revealing that their lives isn't really connected to Christ as we think they are. And so sometimes we get frustrated with people in our grace group and different things. And why aren't they doing this? I thought they were further along. And we get frustrated because in reality, they're not as close to Jesus as we think they are. And so the fruit is revealing to us that, hey, I need to really get them solid in their faith. And maybe for you in your life, if you're not producing godly characteristics, maybe that's an indication that your life isn't really connected to Jesus as it should be. Because the closer we are to Jesus, eventually our lives will produce fruit. The fruit that reflects who we're connected to. You can't fool people with the fruit. Like, it really shows who we are connected to. That's why Galatians 5, 22 to 23 says this. It's describing the fruit of the Spirit. It says this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. One fruit produces a multitude of qualities in our lives. It's not fruits, plural, but one fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, produces all of these characteristics. And so it, this list right there is basically saying that as, as we are connected to Christ, our lives should have these qualities growing in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a positive sense in our lives, growing stronger. Now look at that list. Put that verse back up. Look at this list, and then look at your life, and kind of do a comparison thing. Like, are you growing, not just having these things, these qualities, but are you growing in these different qualities in your life? How are you doing with it in the area of love? Are you thinking about others or are you thinking more about yourself? Because the real issue about love is when, when we truly love God and other people, we put them in front of ourselves. Selfishness is really the opposite of love. It's basically putting our needs and our wants ahead of other people. So how are we doing in that area in love? Are we really loving or are we being selfish in our lives? Peace, joy, forbearance. Forbearance is basically patience. How are you doing in your patience? Like, do you get easily frustrated when things don't go in your way and your time? Or are you growing in this attitude of just trusting God with your life? Knowing that his timing is the perfect timing and his way is the perfect way. Are you trying to manipulate things to make it happen on your own? And the last one I like in this list is self-control. Are we being ruled by our emotions? Are we controlling our emotions? Because the fruit of the spirit means that we're not being led by our emotions. We're being led by faith. And we're making decisions based on faith. Not based on how we feel, but based on what God has called us to do with our lives and when we're self-controlled, we're basically not allowing our lives to be controlled by emotions, but we're controlling our emotions according to the word of God. So how are we doing in these different areas? I know you're looking at the list and like, wow, that's a lot I need to work on. The key to this is staying connected to Christ. It's not trying to manufacture these qualities on your own because none of us in here can do that. These are the fruits of being connected to Christ. The more that we're connected with him, eventually these qualities will be evident in our life. One fruit produces all of these different qualities. And so who are we connected to? If we are really connected with Christ, our lives will be evident with these, these different things, these different emotions, these different qualities that honor God and further his kingdom. Honor God and further his kingdom. I know many of us have done this before and... Uh, 
How many have ever been guilty of using your phone as a mirror before? Anyone? I know everyone in this place. You're laughing because everyone has done it. You know what I mean? Like you want to see how you look, so you flip on the front-facing camera and you just kind of, how many of, just be honest in church. Can we do that? How many of us, guys have done this too, which is honestly surprising to me. Like guys kind of try to sneak it in, like, you know, make sure everything is in check, right? Um, girls, you did this all the time and um, make sure that your, your makeup is right, your, your eyebrows is drawn in correctly and all that good stuff. Um, but all of us have, have done this at one point in our lives. And really why we do that is because we can't see ourselves. We need some help to actually see who we really are and what we really look like. In our minds, we think we look good, but we have no idea that there's a booger hanging out, right? And so you check, oh, yeah, I got this, you know, clean that thing up. There's no app for this in our lives spiritually. God has given us a gift of other people to be mirrors to us. We can use the phone to check our physical self, but spiritually speaking, there's no app or an iPhone that allows us to do this. It's really called relationships. And relationships in our lives are basically people that love us enough to tell us how we really look. Like if you have a really good friend, when you, when you have bad breath, your friend will immediately offer you, you gum. You know what I mean? A, f- a, a bad friend will just basically tell the other person, Bro, that guy's breath stinks, you know what I'm saying? That's not a good friend. Nobody wants a friend like that that just basically outs you that you have stink breath. You want a friend in your life that actually gives you some gum and says, bro, be brushing your teeth, hair. I'm going to help you out right now. You know what I'm saying? But spiritually speaking, we can't see ourselves. We need other people to be mirrors to us. And I'm giving us a glimpse on what we're going to talk about next week. But all of us in our mind have an idea of what we are. And then other people actually have the reality of who we are. And so we need people in our lives to actually help us to see, how am I doing in this area of my life? How am I doing growing in the fruits of the Spirit? Is my life a reflection of that scripture? Help me out. Give me areas in my life that I don't think, that I can't see on my own. Speak into me. And if you really have people who love you enough to tell you some hurtful things, but in love, they can reveal to you, yeah, you got to work on that area in your life. That patience we need to work on. That really, that about genuine loving right now, you kind of put yourself above other people and we all have to walk around you. And so when we have people who genuinely love us that way, that is the only way we can actually see ourselves for who we are, but begin to trust God in that area of our lives. So who do you have in your life right now that can actually be a good mirror to you? If you don't have anyone, there's no reason for these qualities to be evident because you think that you're good on your own. But God And his love has never called us to do life by ourselves. We all need people. Say, we all need people. We all need people. We're going to talk about more about that next week. In your notes, again, bad foundations have eternal implications. We're not just talking about the here and now, but the actions and the choices that we live and make right now don't just affect our tomorrows, but affects our eternities. Verses 21 to 23 says this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter, enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me, that word many scares me because it means more than one. But a lot of different people are going to say that, God, didn't I do this in your name? Or didn't I do all the good things that a, a good Christian person should do? Isn't my life, I'm, I'm prophesying in your name, I'm doing miracles. A person who should be able to do miracles should be able to get into the heaven, right, in the kingdom of God. But basically what God says is this, get away from me because I never knew you. What is God saying? He's basically saying that godly actions without a godly relationship won't ever give us eternal life. He's basically saying that it's the relationship that produces the actions, not vice versa. So many times we would just think, I just got to do these different things to get God to love me more. And in reality, that's a lie because God already loves us the same. And if we're trying to do these actions to gain his approval, then we're going to find out on the, the bad side of eternity that we basically were putting our eggs in the wrong basket. Because it really what God is after is intimacy in our lives. Because true intimacy with him produces these godly attributes. Produces a heart that wants to do things for him. But the scary part is this, that we can be doing all the right things. We could be showing up to church. We can be showing up to grace group. We can be singing in worship and doing all these different things, serving and doing all great things. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with these things. 
But if we're using that as a reason in which God should be able to love us and take us into heaven without a relationship with him, then we're going to be oddly disappointed when eternity comes. When we come face to face with God because he wants an intimate relationship. Intimate relationship. So I'll take a shot with this. I've, I've, I've shared this with a few different people, and they said, ah, you know, I don't know if you should share this, but I'm going to share this because I thought this was profound for me. And so they're talking about, I never knew you. This word knew is basically a word that is used in the Bible to describe a, a intimacy that a husband would have with a wife. It's that kind of true intimacy. And really what sex is, is a celebration of intimacy in the context of marriage. And so what God is basically saying is that I want to have that real intimate relationship with you. And if we're thinking about intimacy, God also uses this. In Isaiah, he talks about that our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Okay, this is going to be kind of graphic, but it's a natural part of life. So filthy rags is basically a, a term that is used to describe like a woman's menstrual cycle. Okay, so filthy rags kind of is a dirty thing. Women, can you agree that's dirty? Okay, we don't have to go descriptive with that. And so what God is saying is that. Our righteous works, apart from him, is kind of like filthy rags. So let me explain what he's basically saying. And so when we're thinking about, uh, I looked this up, biology. Um, when a gr- woman goes through her, her cycle, basically what happens is this. That every single month, your body produces a mature egg that basically goes down to your fallopian tubes. And if it's not fertilized through intimacy, that basically means that the egg dies and which produces the blood. Okay? What God is saying when he's talking about filthy rags is saying that without true intimacy with me, in the context of what happens between a husband and a wife, if we don't have that intimacy, anything that you do for me won't ever produce life. It will always produce death. Think about this, okay? So he's basically saying to us that in order for us to conceive life together, the key element here is not what you do for me. It's how we are connected relationally. Because if we're truly connected in an intimate sense, our lives would always produce life. There's going to be things that gets birthed out of our spirit, gets birthed out of our our hearts and our desires. God basically begins to breathe down destiny and purpose into our lives. But that only comes as we're connected with him. If you try to do this thing on your own, guess what happens? You're going to have spiritual PMS. You're going to be grouchy, spiritually bloated. Right? You're going to basically feeding all these different cravings. It's not a pleasure to be around because you're super grouchy. That's what happens to us spiritually when we try to do things for God apart from God. But when we have the intimate connection, when we're connected with him intimately, in that same way as a husband and a wife meet together in the union that celebrates true intimacy called sex, then our lives bring forth life. And we get to celebrate what God is doing in and through us. And no longer will these things that we do for God pretty much pull us away from him. But it actually brings life that people celebrate, that people are attracted to, that people actually want to be drawn closer because they're not seeing you, but they're seeing the life that God is birthing in you. That only happens as we're connected with him. So many of us want the fruit of an intimate relationship with God, but none of us want to put the work that takes to actually have an intimate relationship with him. You think intimacy just happens overnight? No, let me tell you, it takes intentional effort. I started dating, and let me tell you, you got to be, like, intentional about telling the person that you love and care about them. Like, girls, you want to hear that every single day. Like, in my head, I was thinking, like, I just spent two hours with you. Can I just have a day to myself? That doesn't happen in a relationship. You can't take breaks from God. Okay? You can't. Every single day is an opportunity for us to draw near to God. And the reality is this. If we're not drawing near to God, we're eventually slowly drifting away from him. And so if we're not intentional with making time in our lives to not only say he's Lord, but to actually grow in knowing who he is through the context of prayer and his word, then our lives will never ever produce the life that God has intended for us to see and to have. That always comes through an intimate relationship with him. And as we come to a close, as the worship team comes up, we're talking about lordship. And really what this lordship means is it's the foundational building block 
that begins with God and it begins in our hearts. Romans 10, 9 says this, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So it's both the confession in our lives but also a belief in our hearts that allows us to have a secured relationship with God but also growing in intimacy with him. And so it begins with God and it begins in our hearts, okay? It starts there. It starts inside of our hearts. Lordship begins with knowing who God is and who we are in him. Lordship is about knowing God, not just with our head, but allowing him to transform our heart through spending time with him. Lordship is not just about following God on, his ter- on, on our terms, but it's basically following God on his terms. Many times we come to God and we're saying, I'm going to follow you on my terms, in my times, in my way. But true lordship is saying, I surrender all to you. Whatever you want me to do in your time and in your way, I put my agenda aside and I make your agenda my priority in my life. That's what true surrender looks like. And this lordship can be seen through the acronym LORD. It's in your notes. L stands for a love for Jesus. It always begins with a love for Jesus but also understanding his love for us. And as we understand how much we are loved by him, let me tell you, we will love him back. O stands for obedience to his word. If we really want to be intimate with God, we can't just read about him, but we have to obey the things that he's calling us to do. Obedience is always the immediate application that happens out of true intimacy with God. R is repentance from sin. And really what repentance is, is basically a 180 that we're heading away from God and we're making a decision in our lives to choose God over everything else. True repentance is not making excuses. It's taking ownership of the areas in our lives where we fell short. And when we come to God honestly saying, God, I fell short. I failed in this area of my life with you. God, forgive me. You know what happens? God immediately forgives us because of the work on the cross. So repentance from sin And the last, the D, is probably the hardest part because true lordship means that we have to die to ourselves. It's not a physical death, but it's really an emotional death, a death to our selfishness, a death to our old habits and mindsets, a death to our old way of thinking. And this is not just a one-time death, but a daily death every single day saying, God, I die to myself in in order for me to have life in you. Like I die to myself. Because Lord, I don't want to do this right now. But Lord, I'm putting you over myself and my emotions. So I'm going to die to what I want to do in order to bring life to what you called me to do. And as we do this, let me tell you, you're going to grow in intimacy with God. And a lot of everything that I just shared is based on understanding God's heart for you and I. Like if we don't really understand his heart, for us to actually do this thing, it's really impossible. Actually, we can actually say to God, God, that's kind of like you're asking for too much. But when we understand his heart, let me tell you, this thing becomes easy. I had this revelation uh, a couple of days ago. How many of you know that a lot can be said, not by what we say, but just by the look on our face, that like that can say a, a million things. How many of you know a, a look in itself is a powerful thing? How many of you know that? You ever been in a situation right now where you're with your friends, maybe in class, and then you see something funny, maybe a friend, uh, maybe a friend but a classmate trips in class, and you immediately look for your friend in class, and you don't say anything, but you just make that look, and you both start laughing because you know that you have the same humor, right? And so you just kind of connect and land across the room, you're like, <laughs> you see, I see, you know, you just kind of recognize them. But a, a look is a powerful thing, very powerful in a positive sense, but also in a negative sense. So I've been uh, working out at the gym, and I got this new partner. He's a coach. He's really good at CrossFit, okay? He's really strong dude, and he's really, like, on another level. So I started working out with him for, like, the past couple weeks. And he's been helping me, coaching me, trying to help me to get better, do these different things, giving me techniques and different stuff to increase my lifts and different things like that. And so whereas we were working out, and then when he tells me something, hey, you got to do this. And so when I, when I don't do it, the look on his face speaks like a million things, okay? So this is exactly what happens. So say, okay, make, you make sure you keep your butt down and you lift with your shoulders. And so I, I don't do it the way he wants me to. And this is exactly what happens. He goes like this. 
Like he's so frustrated to the point where he just goes like this. Oh my gosh, like why can't you get it? All right? And I don't know about you, but I can be kind of a sensitive dude, okay? I'm just going to be real. And so as, as much as I want to get the lift, and I'm looking at his face in frustration, and he's looking at me like, oh my gosh, why couldn't you do it, right? He's not saying that, but his look basically says it all. He didn't say anything, but what, exactly what I perceive him saying is that like, oh, you don't get it. You're so dumb, okay? And you know what happened to me? It demotivated me from actually wanting to exercise anymore. Because I look like, ah, oh, not going to get it. Forget this. And God spoke to me in that moment about how powerful a look is. Dang it. You see, it's easy to keep God as Lord when you've got everything going right. And you're killing it. And you're doing everything that he wants you to do. But the hardest thing to do is keep God Lord. When you're failing at a different area in your life. <laughs> Many of us think that when we don't get it right, when we're not obeying and living up to God's standards, we think that when God looks at us, he's like that. Oh my gosh, are you serious? Again, you're struggling with the same stuff. Come on, how many times? How many times are you going to do that? How many times are you going to mess up? And we project that onto God thinking that when we fall, that's his heart for you and I. Discuss. Come on, you can't get it? Are you serious? And because of maybe how we were raised or different cultures in our lives, we think that God looks at us like that. Let me tell you, that's so furthest from God's heart for you and I. That it's in when we, when we really hit rock bottom. He's not there to beat us up, but he's there to lift us up. The Bible says in Psalms that Psalms 3.3, 3, that God is the lifter of our heads. He's not there to push us down in the dirt. He's there to pick us back up. He's saying, I believe in you. Don't identify yourself with this failure because my purpose and plans for you supersede this situation. Don't short circuit who you think I am based on your past experience because my heart is so far from that. We think God is a mean God, wants to jump on us when we fall short. Let me tell you, God is a loving God. And he's there to pick us up when we fall. And when we understand that this is the true heart of God, that he loves us. And he's there walking with us in our shortcomings and in our failures. It's so hard and so tempting to run away from God when we feel like we're not doing it right. When we're not making him Lord. But that's the very moment that he wants to be Lord in our lives. So that we run to him. Because it's only through him and knowing him intimately that he'll give us the strength to overcome these different things in our lives. We'll never ever overcome the addictions and the strongholds in our lives apart from God. It's only through intimacy that we have the strength to overcome it. And so when we feel like we're so far from God, that's the moment where God is so near to us. And he's saying, don't run away from me, but run to me. I'm, only here, I'm here to wrap you in my arms. When you feel like a failure let me tell you that's the most moment right there that I love you and I want to pick you up from that and when we understand that this is the heart of God it's easy to give everything to him it's easy to surrender all to him because apart from him we can't do anything and when God says he wants our all we're able to totally say God I give you my all because you gave it all for me you sent your best you sent Jesus your son so that I can have victory over these different areas of my life. So when we're talking about lordship, it's having an understanding that God is a loving God. And he's after our good. And when we have this mindset in our heart, not just in our head, but in our heart, and we really believe it, it's easier to keep him lord, not only in the successes, but in our failures. And when we understand that he's lord of all, and he loves us the same, Everything that we're talking about here becomes evident in our lives. The fruit will eventually come. Fruit doesn't just get birth overnight. It takes a while. Maybe some of us here are getting frustrated with where you are right now. God is just saying, keep trusting. Eventually, you're going to see the fruit. It's going to take some time. But don't run away from me in the process. Keep staying connected. Grow in intimacy with me. And see what I want to do in it through your life. And on this first Sunday of this new year, I really wanted to set the tone of our hearts. That it's not about what we do for God, but understanding who God is and his heart for you and I. 
And when we have this foundational block called lordship set in our lives, the winds and the rain is going to come. It's not about if, it's a matter of when. But when they come, we're so firmly rooted in who God is. We might be able to sway here and forth, but we're going to be solid. We're going to persevere. And we're going to come out better through storms because we're staying connected to the source. And that's Jesus himself. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for this word. God, more than great information in our minds, Lord, we pray tonight that our hearts would be transformed. God, I pray right now, Lord, that you would reveal your heart for us. God, all of us in our lives and in our minds have this perceived notion of who you are, and many times it contradicts your word. It's so far from your heart for us. And so, Lord, I pray that right now, whatever lies are in our minds, God, that is preventing us from knowing you intimately, I pray that you would shatter those lies with your love because your love covers a multitude of sins. It covers a multitude of lies. It covers a multitude of mistakes. That's really what your love does. And Lord, tonight we say that you are Lord. And we pray that you would reveal yourself as Father in our hearts tonight. We thank you for who you are. In your name we pray.